In baseball, it's very common to have players come out of nowhere and put together very good seasons. It could be a rookie who spent years in a team's farm system, or a veteran who just kind of figured it out over time. There are probably many players that you didn't know were all-stars just because of one or two good years they had. A very well-known player that meets the criteria I just described is Jacoby Ellsbury. In 2011 with Boston, he hit 32 home runs with 105 RBIs, 39 stolen bases, and a 321 batting average. He was American League MVP runner-up and made his first and last career All-Star appearance. You can look at Ellsbury's stats on Baseball Reference, and you'll see that no other year comes remotely close to what he did in 2011. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there's Mike Trout, who since his 2012 rookie season has been putting up these Ellsbury 2011 type numbers and even better year after year after year for over a decade. He should be a unanimous first ballot Hall of Famer, and even now at the age of just 31, many consider him to be the greatest baseball player of all time. There's one word that separates the Jacoby Ellsburys from the Mike Trouts of the world, and that word is consistency. If you took any of the best seasons from Trout's career and looked at the numbers, obviously you'd think they're amazing and MVP caliber, but these aren't like record-breaking video game numbers that only Mike Trout can put up. But the thing that makes him so great is he has no problem putting up these numbers on a year-to-year -year basis, while most other players who put up similar numbers to him for a single season can never replicate it again just once in their career. The same players that belong in the Jacoby Ellsbury category. Players such as Javier Baez. In this video, we're going to break down the rise of Javier Baez, which saw him become a World Series champion and MVP runner-up, and the fall that caused him to be one of the least efficient players currently in Major League Baseball. Before I go any further, welcome to The War Room, a channel where I discuss all things sports related. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, and let's get straight to it. Ednel Javier Baez was born in Bayamon, Puerto Rico on December 1st, 1992. However, in 2005, when Javi was in middle school, he, his mother, sister, and three brothers moved to Jacksonville, Florida. When Javi came to America, he barely knew any English. He said that it took him about three years of listening to English from teachers and his friends at school before he picked it up. He attended Arlington Country Day School in Jacksonville, and it was here that he began turning heads and gained recognition as one of the best high school players in the country. In his first varsity season, he batted 463 with 13 home runs and 41 RBIs in 25 games. While these are incredible numbers, they're nothing compared to his next varsity season, believe it or not, because the next year he had a batting average at 771 with 22 home runs, 20 doubles, and 52 RBIs with a slugging percentage of 1.807. At this point, he was ranked by Perfect Game as the ninth best player in the country, behind guys like Bryce Harper, Francisco Lindor, Jose Fernandez, and Josh Bell. Javi was committed to play college baseball at Jacksonville University. At least that was the plan until the 2011 MLB draft came around. Baez was pretty much guaranteed to be a top pick in the first round, it was just a matter of who was going to take him. Garrett Cole went first, Trevor Bauer went third, Anthony Rendon went sixth, Francisco Lindor went eighth, and with the ninth pick, the 18-year-old Javier Baez got drafted by the Chicago Cubs. Tim Wilkin, Chicago scouting director at the time, said, quote, I love Baez from the first time I saw him because of the athleticism he showed and the unbelievable bat speed he possessed at a young age. I knew he was raw, but I also knew that he had potential to be one of the best players in baseball if he worked hard and refined his game. This scouting report from Wilkin was absolutely spot on, but years before Baez proved him right, the teenager had to prove himself in the minor leagues. In 2012, at age 19, he played a mix of A-ball and high A-ball. In total between the two, he played in 80 games and had pretty good stats. In 2013, at age 20, it was a mix of high A ball and double A. He played in 130 games with a 282 batting average, 37 home runs, and 111 RBIs. It was here that he was beginning to show flashes of being a legitimate MLB player. It was also at these levels when it became abundantly clear that if there was one weakness to Javi's game, it was his plate discipline. He struck out 147 times in those 130 games, and some members of the front office were frustrated with his inability to lay off sliders out of the zone, which is a very important piece of information to remember for the future. The Cubs still wanted to see how he would play in AAA, so the next season in 2014 with the Iowa Cubs, Baez played in 104 games, again putting up solid numbers with lots of strikeouts. The Chicago Cubs were a last place team in 2014 that was still in the rebuilding process, and I guess they figured they had nothing to lose. 
So on August 5th, 2014, they called up Baez from AAA to play second base in a game versus the Colorado Rockies. A smart move since they clearly weren't going to make the playoffs and their top prospect can get a taste of MLB pitching for a few months. Baez played in 52 MLB games to finish the 2014 season. He batted a very bad 169 with 9 home runs, 20 RBIs, and 95 strikeouts. 95 strikeouts in 52 games is equal to 295 strikeouts for a full 162 game season. So again, it was clear which part of his game needed improvement. The Cubs felt he wasn't ready just yet, so he spent the 2015 season back in Iowa. After 70 more games there, his numbers improved significantly. In early September of the 2015 season, the Cubs tried the same thing again, calling him up to the bigs to finish the year. The 2015 year was much different than 2014, because when they called Baez up, the Cubs were 74 and 56 with a five and a half game lead for the second National League wild card. Their rebuild was working with guys like Anthony Rizzo, Chris Bryant, and Jake Arrieta leading the charge. So now they actually did have something to lose while calling Baez up. They needed him to make an impact to help the playoff push in Chicago. In the final 28 games, he did all right, but still nothing crazy, batting 290 with one home run and four RBIs, while the Cubs got swept in the NLCS by the Mets. Two months later, Cubs infielder Starlin Castro got traded to the New York Yankees, which meant there was more room for Baez on the 2016 roster. The problem for Javi was the Cubs had another young infielder named Addison Russell, who unlike Baez, was pretty efficient in the big leagues during the 2015 season. So while Russell was trusted as the team's everyday shortstop, Baez was an infield utility man who played games at second base, shortstop, and third base throughout the 2016 season. Despite bouncing around the infield, he still got significant playing time, appearing at 142 games. In those games, he batted 273 with 14 home runs and 59 RBIs, while lowering his strikeouts to 108. Throughout the season, management felt comfortable with him at second base and Russell at short, so that's where they played in the Cubs playoff run. Considering Baez was just starting his MLB career, he played pretty well in the 2016 postseason, batting 265 with two home runs and eight RBIs in 17 postseason games. But the NLCS specifically was terrific for him, as he batted 318 with seven hits and five RBIs in six games versus the Dodgers. These numbers made him NLCS co-MVP with John Lester. 2016, of course, was the year the Cubs had their magical World Series run and won their first championship since 1908. Again, at this point, the face of the Cubs was probably Anthony Rizzo or Chris Bryant, with Javi not really in that conversation. Same could be said in 2017, although he did make a very noticeable improvement from the previous year. He had the same batting average with 9 more home runs and 16 more RBIs. This was the best year of his career thus far, but the question then became, how high is his ceiling? He's heading into his age 25 season in 2018. He's shown flashes of being a very good MLB player, but just hasn't had that breakout year. Were these 2017 numbers as good as it gets, or was there more? Well, 2018 was the year we finally got our answer and saw peak Javier Baez in the major leagues. He played in 160 games that season, batted 290 with 34 home runs and an NL leading 111 RBIs and stole 21 bases, all of which are career highs to this very day. Because of this breakout 2018 season, Baez won Silver Slugger, represented the Cubs in his first career All-Star game, and was the runner-up for the MVP in the National League behind Christian Yelich. This was the Javier Baez the Cubs envisioned when they drafted him seven years prior. This version of Baez was incredibly fun to watch, since he was young, having fun, playing with tons of energy, and was one of the best players in all of baseball. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, this was peak Javier Baez, and it was all downhill from here. 2019 was another very good year. The numbers all dipped a little bit, but he was still an all-star. The COVID year was incredibly rough for him at the plate, although he did win his first career gold glove and was the cover athlete for MLB The Show 20, so there's that. In 2021, the Cubs decided to break up their 2016 World Series core by trading Chris Bryant to the Giants, Anthony Rizzo to the Yankees, and Javier Baez to the New York Mets, where he finally got to team up with Francisco Lindor. Overall, Baez bounced back from his 2020 down year, but the strikeouts and chasing pitches way out of the zone continued to haunt him as he led the National League with 184 strikeouts. If you've been paying any attention to his strikeout numbers throughout this video, you'll notice that Baez never actually improved this part of his game, and it actually got way worse over time. But if you're hitting 260 to 280 with 30 home runs and 80 to 100 RBIs, it doesn't really matter too much if you strike out a lot. It only matters when you strike out a lot if you aren't producing big numbers at all. And that's what happened to Baez in 2022, when he started the first year of a six-year $140 million deal with the Detroit Tigers. This was a very bad season for him, especially considering the fact that he had high expectations once Detroit gave him a fat paycheck. Besides the shortened COVID year, Baez had the least amount of home runs and RBIs since his age 23-2016 season, 
and his worst batting average since his age 21 2014 call-up year. On top of that, his 147 strikeouts ranked 11th in the American League. Baez has always had people think he was overrated, and many people felt that Detroit only gave him this large deal because of the two all-star seasons he had. The thing about Javi is when he's good, he's really good, but when he's bad, he's atrocious. But he's had bad years before where he bounced back, plus he's got 5 more seasons to prove he was worth the contract. A good 2023 year would be huge for him, and he's still got about 150 more games to do it, but he's not off to a very good start. In 15 games so far, he's batting 184 with 0 home runs, 6 RBIs, 10 strikeouts, and recently got benched in a game versus the Blue Jays because he forgot how many outs there were. While again, he continues to have countless ugly swings on pitches nowhere near the strike zone. Baseball Savant is a website that has advanced metrics for hitters and ranks them in certain percentiles based on these metrics barrel percentage is one of them. This takes the amount of balls a batter put into play divided by the amount that hit the barrel of their bat. This season, Javi is in the first percentile for this metric, meaning he's one of the worst in the league. For chase rate, the amount of balls a hitter swings at out of the zone, Baez is in the third percentile. With all these different types of metrics taken into account, the website compares him this season to players in the past with similar seasons. Players that 2023 Javier Baez is compared to is 2021 Jesus Sanchez, a 23-year-old rookie for the Marlins at the time, 2020 Michael Chavis, who batted 212 with 5 home runs and 50 strikeouts in 42 games with the Red Sox, or 2016 A-Rod, the final season of his career when he was 40 years old, batted 200 with 9 home runs in 65 games, and could barely run without throwing his hip out. Some may think I jumped the gun by making this video, but I've also been watching Baez play for years. Right now in 2023, he's arguably worse than his early years with the Cubs. What was once an electric young rising star who was one of the best players in the league is now looking like an overpaid washed up vet who was just a more recent version of Jacoby Ellsbury. I'm not the type to root for anyone's downfall, I'm just calling it how I see it. I really do hope Javi figures it out and gives Tigers fans something to cheer about, but if not, we can officially say we saw the rise and fall of Javier Baez. But that wraps up this video, let me know in the comments what you guys think, I'm always curious to see what you have to say. Please like the video if you enjoyed and subscribe to the channel if you're new. I'm going to be making MLB content like this all season long. Thank you guys for watching and as always, I'll see you guys in the next one.